Morning. Morning, Adriana. How are you guys doing? Good, how are you? Pretty good, how about you? Good. Yeah. Just you and me, Jason? It looks like D's here. I didn't look like... again. Yeah, we're all coming together. Brooke is hopping on. Yeah. I see Nico. Is that you, Nico, from Shelterwood? Hey, Judy. Hey, folks. Yes, it is. Good morning, all. How's construction going out there, Nico? Oh, we're getting there. We're finally in our houses. Very nice. Yeah. That's got to be real nice. <laughs> Yes, hey, not sharing a cabin with a bunch of mice is a treat. <laughs> yeah. We should talk soon, Nico. Uh, we're starting to look at Moorheart Ridge. And um, oh, great. Perfect timing. Yeah. So uh, we'll make, I would like to make a point to, to talk to you uh, about how we can collaborate great. on that. Excellent. I'll make a note of following up with you after this. Okay. And we'll start the meeting in just a couple minutes, <clears throat> let everybody get in, or should we just go ahead and start our, um, um, start our uh, little sharing time? What do you think? I think we've got a good number here. Why don't we get started? Okay. So um, I think it would be good uh, to um, just go around as we usually do, say our names, what we're doing, and a brief uh, description of, uh, of what uh, you guys, what you each wanna share today, <coughs> excuse me. And I will start with, I can't see the screen, just a minute. I'm doing too many things. How about uh, Jason Wells? What's up, Jason? I was hoping you wouldn't start with me, but... Um... Uh, I've actually had some time to write management plans, which is good. So that's pretty much what I've been, what I've been trying to hammer out. It's just finishing you up. You've been the, doing what? I didn't hear you. Management plans. Management? Our, one of our largest funding sources in the last five or six years has been the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. That's a program through NRCS. And it was for doing um, management planning and carbon farm plans and soil sediment saving type things, vineyard management plans. And then when I came on, we were using it for forest management plans. And uh, we have to finish that deliverable um, by the end of this year. So it's good to have some time to push and finish writing individual management plans so that people can use Equip. So. Great. Yep. All right. How about Madam Rosales? And Judy, you're on mute. Oh, I was just saying, speaking of management plans, we're, um, I was talking to Fred about um, writing some management planning into the, the forest health grant uh, because we had uh, considered putting in the block grant. Um, and I did a brief survey just through our community listserv, not even targeting our forestry um, audience. And we got like 21 people in less than 48 hours who want forest management plans. Woohoo! Yeah, so that was pretty good. And so we wanna pursue that. And um, so I was talking to Fred um, and we were looking at how we could possibly teach people to do their own management plans and have uh, foresters oversee uh, see this project. We're looking into that, uh, but that's, that's down the road. Uh, one of the things that we're very excited about right now is that um, we are one of the four grants, uh, CAL FIRE grants that got awarded to Sonoma County. And uh, this is a, a project that we started working on a couple of years ago, actually with Jason. Um, 
through uh, funding by the North Coast Re uh, Regional Partnership. And um, we didn't get um, that project, the big project funded uh, the last round of CAL FIRE um, grants, but we did get it funded this time. And so um, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, but right now we're getting Port Ross Road off the ground and um, it, it's taken a lot of time right with permitting and um, all of our surveys are done, biological surveys, uh, the uh, spotted owl surveys, uh, everything's ready to go. And one issue that we are having, and maybe uh, one of you can um, send us in a, in a direction. When we wrote this grant, fuel prices were $4.40 a gallon. And we uh, rounded it up to $5, thinking that, um, you know, that gave us some wiggle room. Um, well, now they're up to seven, you know, uh, diesel is seven and, and above. So we're um, pretty much looking, uh, we can either cut acreage. Uh, I'm looking for money. I'm looking for potential um, micro grants, you know, non-competitive grants where we can get 10,000 here, 10,000 there, 20,000 there. You know, uh, what started out as about we, what we estimated at 5,000 an acre is now about $6,500 an acre for this kind of work. So um, we were able to get uh, the three contractors who bid on the project, they're local. Um, they agreed to do the job, the three of them working together for less money um, because they live here. And um, Fort Ross Road is a main access road to all of our communities. And, uh, and then, you know, there's a the potential for more work down the line. I did uh, write to uh, the California Fire Safety Council. I have uh, an email here to the county. Uh, and I forgot somebody else, you know, that we're asking uh, for funding. So if anyone knows of where we might be able to find some funding, uh, please let me know. Uh, and I think right now, Fort Ross and Kelp Fire, I, as I was just saying to Nico earlier, we're working on our, um, on the next grant, um, the fire, fire prevention, We'll be finishing our roads here. We do have an obligation to extend Fort Ross Road to 100 feet shaded fuel break. Uh, we're only doing 30 feet with this funding uh, because we got less than what we had applied for. So uh, we're looking at more Heart Ridge, possibly another ridge over there on the coast, um, maybe Smith Ridge. Uh, I'm not sure yet. And, uh, but we're also working on a forest health grant through the uh, Sonoma Coast Collaborative. And uh, where we'll be uh, working with Sasha Burlman on fire. We have a number of community grazers here in this community now and formalizing a grazing program. Uh, Jason, I'm hoping that we can find a way to work with you and what you're doing with the Walla River Watershed Council. So we can include uh, watershed health, um, in, in this project as well. So we're doing our planning now so that we have these projects at least outlined and the framework to the projects ready when the grants are announced. And I think that's about it right now. Um, yep, that's it for us. Thank you. Terrific, thank you so much. I just wanted to follow up on two things. Uh, you were wondering with Fred how to work with landowners to to teach them how to do that whole thing. UC Cooperative Extension has had their forestry workshop series that's been going on now for about two years. There's an online in Lake County is their, their next one and that starts June 30th. So uh, if anybody's interested in doing that out of your 20 some odd people, like hop on that now. Yeah, uh, I have to sit down, but thank you for the reminder, yeah. Yep, and then that goes just for anybody who's, who's listening that that program is available um, to help landowners learn a little bit more about land planning. Um, and then for fuel costs, I would check in with After the Fire. That's, um, that's the Rebuild North Bay Foundation. For something like a micro grant, they might be interested in something like that just to bump up the fuel costs. Um, just see if they're available. And then maybe also NCRP 
might be another one. Um, they came in pretty good for our previous uh, little small burst of funding. So check in with them. And then you just reminded me to re mention Walala. Um, we are like almost signed. <laughs> we, <laughs> it, it, like we applied for this grant in January, I think at 21 or something like that. And we like almost have the, the funds signed and, and ready to, to do stuff. Uh, also, we're currently looking for a, uh, a forestry technician. So um, I just reflew that job and, or we're reflying it, I guess. Um, so hopefully that works out. I have one applicant that I'm gonna to talk to tomorrow. And then that would be really nice to have some extra help. So. Okay, Great. terrific. Um, how about um, Madam Adriana? <laughs> Thank you, Dee, for your cordial invitation <laughs> to speak. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, doing well over here. I guess I have a couple updates. Um, one of them it was related to the Fire Prevention Grant Awards, but maybe I'll just save that for the next part of the agenda when we'll talk about those specifically. Um, although, Judy, it was great that you already told us about yours. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> very efficient. Um, but for the RCD, I think, um, I guess something I can say is that it looks like we're going to have uh, funding to continue the Landsmark Community Grazing Program that we started last, last fall, and that is um, funded through the county's uh, Vegetation Management Program. Um, so thanks to him and the, the board there. Um, and basically, it works with uh, Match.Graze, the UCCE program, to match up grazers with people who need grazing done, specifically in high fire areas, to manage um, fuels. So that's um, goat and sheep grazing. They can do grass and, and um, you know, uh, browse up the tree. Um, we had a really good... Um, you know, interest in the program last year, enough that we, we definitely want to continue it this year. So um, we'll probably fly applications for that um, in a, a little later this summer to get grazing done this early fall. Um, so keep your eye out for that. I'll pass it out to the listserv once we are ready to take applications. Um, and then another thing that I don't think I've really talked too much about at these meetings, but um, is probably of interest and I'm glad Jason Wells is on the call here because I was, um, it looks like we have uh, finished a draft of a community forest management plan in the Joy uh, Woods area of Occidental. And that's just something that I know this group has always been interested in, in is like how to get more landowners doing things together. And Judy reminded me of it too. Um, so there are, you know, multiple uh, small, relatively small parcels, uh, but like between 10 and 20 acres, a little funny or fuzzy on the details because we haven't talked about it in a while, but we had maybe like 30 landowners in that area who wanted to do a forest management plans. They weren't contiguous, um, but they did kind of comprise a, a unified area. And um, we worked with Matt Green to put together a collaborative uh, plan for those landowners. So they, you know, part of that planning included just like a lot of community built, um, community meetings and consensus building around the kinds of activities that they wanted to see done. Um, so there's kind of like big picture goals. And then every landowner has their own uh, agenda, like their own page on their own property that talks specifically about their infrastructure and any uh, anything that they need to bring up specific to their, their parcel. And it was kind of our first go at this sort of a big um, multi, like that many landowners doing a, a collaborative forest management plan. So. Um, it was sort of a pilot for us, and uh, I think the process is going smooth, um, but yeah, it, it really helped to meet a goal that the community had to be more proactive about um, forest management in non-industrial lands, um, not even like, you know, of a size that they could do harvests on their own. So I don't know, Jason, if you want to add anything to that. Um, I guess I'd only say that the properties ranged from like two acres to 100 or, or I guess that that Tannery Creek is probably closer to 300 or something like that but um most of them are in that like two acre <laughs> zone so it's, it's like really small for management um uh, but yeah I'm just trying to figure out how to plan at a multiple landowner scale and get people thinking 
outside of, I guess, their own property. So. Yeah, thanks. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, would that be more like a CWPP that you're doing with them? Yeah. Ned actually still uses the, the state's forest management plan template. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. It is specifically for forest management planning. Um, and um, Adriana, I'm thinking about the people on Old Cass Highway. They're doing something similar. They're trying to bring landowners together. How would, who would they get in touch with uh, to talk to someone uh, about what you're doing over there on Joy Road? Well, um, they could talk to me or Jason. Um, we have limited funding for planning, although, uh, and limiting staff capacity for planning, but we've been working, like I said, with Matt Green and other, um, you know, contracted foresters to help us with, with that part. Um, again, Jason, feel free to jump in. <laughs> well, uh, the reason I was just going to say in terms of funding, so, uh, Really, our capacity is going to depend on whether or not I'm able to hire a technician. Um, that's going to be the biggest thing. So I have four years of dedicated funding from Cal Fire to write management plans for people, which is amazing. And now I just need someone to help me do it. Um, and then we also have through um, the North Bay Forest Improvement Program. Uh, I know that usually that's supposed to be more of a one on one sort of thing. And I don't know if we've settled on whether or not we would have multi-property management plans. I think that would probably be a conversation that we would have to have. Um, but that's possibly an option also. And that would be a flat rate. So you'd be looking at um, the landowners having to pay for it, basically. And then we would pay them back, which gets complicated the more people that you have involved in something like that. So it was nice that the, the RCPP money that we had we were able to pretty much fund it through RCPP. And then we asked for a really nominal cost share from, from landowners to, to develop that document. So, um, but what's nice is when you have something like that, you can then point to, we've done this before and this is what this looks like. And so then in future funding, we can actually point to something and say like, we wanna do something like this or improve even on what we were able to do. So, um, but yeah, it was like 30 landowners and the planning area covers more like 150 landowners. And we made it in a way that we're hoping that we can convince the not onboard landowners that this is what they want to do. And that then through the addendum system, all of the planning is already done and we can amend their own personal goals, objectives, needs, whatever's different, you know, goes into the plan then as an attachment and then we would be able to then send them to NRCS for, for funds, or we use this plan now as a, as a guidance document to reference when we write full scale forest health grants or forest fire prevention grants. And we can at least say we've already gone through a community planning process involving 30 plus stakeholders in the area, so. And just that's, that's actually what I was thinking about is because uh, in our uh, NCRP, you know, has just announced that they have technical um, grants for technical assistance that they might be able to use that grant to do some planning, uh, which would take some time. And then, um, but being able to uh, direct them to the group that you're working with uh, just for questions, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, send them my way or to Noel from Goldridge. Um, that would probably be the. Okay. Except for, I guess, if they're in your area, send them my way because we're going to be back in, you know, Noma RCD territory. So I might as well just be the one to talk to them. Okay, thank you. Okay, and that's um, the end of my update, Dee. Thanks. Okay. So how about Mr. Kraus? How's your building doing, Ray? Got our first permit yesterday. Woo, so woo. To permit to build a garage took uh, 18 months and lots of money. And now we'll start on a house. Um, Upper Mark West and Diamond Mountain uh, Collaborative had a town hall sponsored by Tals. D, you can speak in more detail about it, but essentially trying to uh, gin up more 
landowner interest in a region that spans both Napa and Sonoma County uh, Eastern Ridges, uh, attended by Susan Gorin and uh, Diane Dillon, uh, supervisor from Napa County. Uh, good turnout uh, and, and some uh, good, inf good information and a lot of landowner interest. So uh, I think it met its objectives. And uh, the collaborative also was one of the Cal Fire grant awardees. So uh, for shaded fuel break planning and, and pond planning. And uh, we're continuing to implement the previous grants on, on uh, defensible space and, and uh, shaded fuel break along Calistoga Road and shaded, and there's a shaded fuel break or two around Gates Road community. So we're moving forward. Um, but D, if you want to add detail on, on the TALS efforts and the grant and the town hall, please do. Okay, well, I really want to uh, just say uh, that it's what, what's to me important and different about this is it's a two county project. So we're going to be moving, we're going to um, erase the boundary lines <laughs> and uh, work together. And the supervisors are committed to, to working with us on that too. And of course, Cal Fire saw that that's what we were doing. So it will be a, a really good um, first step in getting projects uh, working across county lines. Um, and it, we do have quite a bit of funds for community outreach and bringing uh, more leadership um, strategies to the two fire safe councils that uh, are currently involved in the process. So we're really excited about this. It was $176,000. Um, and uh, at the completion of the project, um, we'll have a delineation of pods and smaller management units and we'll have completed the Cal VTP project specific analysis and can move into implementation. Landowners will be more knowledgeable about their uh, project priorities uh, and uh, a, a variety of other things. So I, I just uh, am excited uh, for, the, uh, for the watershed and for the people that live in it. And we have vineyards engaged. Uh, there's lots of vineyards in these areas and we have small vineyards and we also have large vineyards like the Jackson family vineyards and they were there at the town hall. So we're also beginning to bridge the gap uh, with the um, ag community. I think that's all I need to say about it. Ray, you have other stuff? Nope, that's it. Okay. So how about um, Nico? Thanks, Steve. Hi, folks. Um, just a quick note that I'm on satellite Wi-Fi. There's usually a bit of a delay, so apologies for that. Let me know if it don't come through. Um, but over here at Shelterwood Collective, we secured a Cal Fire Forest Health Grant, which we're super excited by. Um, we got it awarded a couple months ago now and are still waiting on the final, or I guess the beginning paperwork and have to do the whole song and dance of getting those things finalized. But we're hoping to do an 850 acre project it will include uh what are we doing we're doing thinnings over about 800 of those acres we're putting in a shaded fuel break along our section of more heart ridge and some interior ridge lines within our um our property boundary um we're coupling that with uh controlled burns we're working with uh the good fire alliance with sasha berlin there as well to do prescribed burns over all 800 of those acres and then we're going to follow up in a few sections doing some redwood planting. So we're just, just getting started thinking about how to actually operationalize that. It's a four and a half year grant. Um, we're in the, the due diligence phases and just starting to think through how we're going to complete the Cal VTP process and conversations with Jason about that and uh, Roger Sternberg, hoping to do that as quickly and as thoroughly and as diligently and as um, thoughtfully as possible so we can actually get the work started. Um, and then a big piece of what we're thinking about for the latter part of the work that we want to start planning now is around the genetic viability of different kinds of redwoods that we want to plant out here. So if folks know any oh. nearby nurseries, uh, if there are any folks that have experienced nursery development, we're trying to stick as closely as possible to this particular part 
of West County. And we might end up developing our own nursery system if we don't find anything nearby. But whatever we, if we do end up doing that, we want to build it in a way that will help support um, our other landowner initiatives around redwood planting and redwood restoration. So just seeding that, uh, that thought, it's a couple years down the line, but putting it out there. And I think that is the biggest thing on our mind right now. We're also going to start thinking about a, a management plan to accompany this work, but are looking for some, some financial support to pull that together. And Redwood Nursery, I just so impressed and excited to um, learn more about, uh, about the progress that you're going to make uh, when you get to that. So thank you very, very much. Um, how about Kyle Renner? Yeah, uh, for those of you that I haven't met, I'm Kyle Renner. I work with an outfit called Terra Verde. We're a forestry consulting firm in the Pacific Northwest here, but I live locally in Santa Rosa. Uh, we've just been, you know, it's our busy field season, busy working on our industrial clients, doing timber surveys, um, you know, forest land inventory. And then we got a couple carbon projects that we're working on this summer. Um, in the carbon space, which might be of interest to those of you in this group, is I think in the next coming months, maybe year, um, there, there is probably going to be some focus in, um, you know, opportunities in the carbon world for things like shaded fuel breaks, where you're basically going to receive credit for, you know, the saved carbon by not having it burn up. Um, so those of you looking for funding, that could be a potential in the future for you guys. Um, so keep your eyes out. <laughs> And that's it for me. <laughs> okay, good. I just want to remind us that we are needing to end right around um, 11. And uh, I believe that some of the comments already have dealt with the fire prevention grants awards or may not have gotten through all of it. So even though we're coming up to 1030, I think we'll still have time for everyone. Um, but if you can be uh, concise, it would be terrific. How about Brooke Edwards? Hello everyone, uh, Brooke Edwards from Sonoma County Regional Parks. Uh, a couple updates. Uh, we have completed our Shiloh Shaded Fuel Break project in which we've uh, created shaded fuel breaks on about five miles of trails. So 50 feet on either side of the trails, we have created a shaded fuel break, fuel reduction work uh, that was funded through the State Coastal Conservancy and we had the seas out there implementing that work. Uh, and that's really part of our longer range plan of using those trails, the shaded fuel breaks as control lines so that we can then use prescribed fire to further reduce fuels in Shiloh uh, and really use prescribed fire as a landscape management tool. Uh, along with that, we are continuing to work on our Cal VTP project for both Foothill and Shiloh. Uh, so we're continuing with that. Uh, we have two staff that are going to the uh, Fire Forward, the Audubon Canyon Ranch Fire Forward Fellowship, uh, and that's a year-long program to train people up to become Burn Boss certified in the state of California. Uh, so that's exciting that we'll have uh, some trained up folks that can actually start to write burn plans uh, and hopefully get their Burn Boss cert. And uh, once we have all the planning in place and seek recovered, uh, we can really start to uh, use prescribed fire in our parks. Um, let's see, uh, I don't see Devin on the call, but uh, I was on a prescribed fire at Pepperwood. Uh, Devin was the burn boss on that. Well, he was a burn boss trainee. Uh, it was part of his burn as going through the ACR um, fellowship program as well. 26 acres, uh, it went really well. Uh, it, was, it was really exciting to, to see um, the team out there. And um, so I just wanted to, to mention that. And then uh, for firefighter two training, which is your basic wildland fire training, I just saw something that come across my desk from an organization called Torch Bear. Uh, they're up out of Wairika. And uh, this is the basic firefighter training that you should get if you wanna take part in Good Fire Alliance trainings. Uh, so I will uh, post this link into the chat box. And so take a look at it. Most of the work is online. And then there's a one day uh, field course up in Wairika. Uh, so maybe you can turn that into a vacation up in, in Northern California. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? 
Oh, and I just wanted to mention to uh, Jason, uh, if you can keep me in the loop on the Gualala watershed work, uh, is that starting to ramp up? Just keep me in the loop in that. And uh, those are my updates. Terrific, good progress. And now we're going to go with um, Ms. Jill Butler. Jill, you want to unmute yourself? Or, or we will we'll give you a minute to do that and we'll go with Fred Ufrat. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, it's good to see everybody here. I don't really have much to add. I'm just uh, deep in the in the thickets of Wildlands Conservancy and trying to recover from the fire. I've got about a five year grant from uh, NRCS, which has been very helpful to do biochar and planting on my uh, damaged land. And I'm also um, because of a 1033 exchange, when your forest land is burned, you get to buy new forest land. So uh, you should be aware of that, especially if it's a federal disaster, then you have four years. It's like a 1031 exchange, but, uh, but not, but it has four years. So if anybody happens to know of um, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 acres of TPZ for sale, do talk to me. Okay, that's it. Okay, terrific. How about um, Ellie Inslee? Hi, Ellie. Hey, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm with the Sonoma Ecology Center, and um, <clears throat> the, went to that that uh, event up at Pepperwood for the Diamond Mountain and uh, Upper Mark West, and that was really a great event. Very interesting. Um, actually, before I say anything, um, where are you? Um, Kyle, can you tell me the name of your organization? I'm, I'm taking notes and just wanted to catch that. Yeah, it's Terra Verde Inc. I'll put it in the group chat here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the only thing I have to mention is, um, uh, I guess most of you know that UC Cooperative Extension, Sonoma Ecology Center, Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, and also um, Pepperwood uh, got a grant to do a handbook on best management principles and practices, as well as uh, workshops. And so we'll be doing that over the next 18 months together. And part of that, uh, we, got, we got some funding from FireSafe Sonoma to do a, a set of workshops and webinars out in, in uh, West County. And we're doing two workshops, fields, they're, they're sort of like more like field visits, one is on July 9th at Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, and one is on July 16th at Schoen Farm, and they'll be led by uh, the illustrious Brock Dahlman at OEEC and Sasha Berlman, I mean, um, sorry, Brianna Boaz at the JC. And uh, so I'm gonna send out something. I know, Adriana, I, I asked you if, if, you know, what's the best way for me to advertise this, but I can just go ahead and put it in the, in the group's IO. Um, but that's from nine to one, and it's it's geared mainly for West County people. But um, we'll accept we can. It'll be th for thirty people, so we'll accept as many people as we can beyond the folks from West County. And then obviously there's going to be more of these coming up, especially with the the conference that the Forest Working Group is putting together in the fall. But this is just like a for a taste of some of the of what's to come with the the ecological best management principles and practices. And uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. All right, very helpful. Ron Rollery, is that how you pronounce it, Ron? Ron, not there. How about Jill, are you back, Jill? There she is. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes the uh, mute and unmuting process takes a while. Um, so Jill Butler representing Gualala River Watershed Council. Uh, let's see, as um, Jason gave the, the update on the uh, Gualala River Collaborative Project and we look forward to starting work on that uh, soon with him and um, Judy and a couple of 
of the other groups on, uh, as well as the forest group will, will be represented uh, on that collaborative. And I'll be the forest group rep. Um, let's see, uh, in the watershed, um, Sean and Emma, our two staff people started uh, stream reach monitoring last month and uh, placed hobo tents to start the uh, uh, temperature monitoring. Uh, and that's, that's all I know about. We, have, we don't have our monthly meeting till next week. And um, here on the home front, I just wanted to mention that I um, got the county chipper people out uh, last, they started taking signups last month and they, they were out in less than two weeks. And this, this year you can sign up to have them come twice. So, um, so just so everybody knows that program's up and running and always a nice option for getting, getting stuff chipped. And um, we work all year on our chipper pile and have what looks to me like a pretty big pile and they usually finish it in about 20 minutes and they'll work for two hours for no charge. So they can do a lot. Uh, and that's all I've got. Well, okay, thanks so much for hanging in here with us. How about uh, now, Ron, are you there, Ron? You wanna unmute? Okay, dokie. So we're gonna go with Shanti Edwards. Hi everybody, I'm Shanti Edwards with Sonoma Land Trust. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with our work, we're a land conservation and stewardship nonprofit um, advancing um, you know, conservation activities in, in all across the county. And um, for the purpose of this meeting, I wanna talk about our fire fuels management work we're doing across the county as well. So each region, we have a clusters of properties that we're um, uh, really trying to get a handle on uh, forest fuels management, wildland fuels, and um, uh, really working on a bunch of plans and, and forest treatments and planning for prescribed burning. Um, at our Lothenburg Ranch Preserve, uh, last week we had our first prescribed burn um, for our organization, and that was a huge success and, a, and just really exciting day for our, our organization. And we um, gathered a multitude of partners and some of you, you know, on this call were there as well. And um, so that was a grassland burn trying to address the yellow star thistle. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I got to be there. Um, on the coast, I'm just plugging away at my projects. As you guys know, we finished our BTP for Little Black Mountain and Pole Mountain. Um, I'm gearing up for our shaded fuel break project um, at uh, Little Black Mountain and then uh, planning for prescribed burning at Pole Mountain later this year and um, delineating new units for additional forest fuels treatment. Um, but I wanna just give a hats off to Jill Butler because all of this started with um, Cal Fire CFIP forest plan grant funding from, from uh, CAL FIRE that Jill helped administer. And so we've come a long way. And so Jill, you're on the call. I wanna thank you for, um, for your role uh, way back when. Um, so just one thing I just wanna mention because we're all here in this group, um, as I'm kind of diving into the kind of the weeds of the work and trying to get sites prepped for, uh, for hopefully doing some pres prescribed broadcast burning later, um, I'm finding out that some of our lop and scatter areas are really not that feasible for, for burning because of how steep the terrain is and how much fuel has been kind of downed across the landscape that it's kind of like a dead forest. There's no light cover, no plants coming up through it. It's not decomposing. It's just so thick and dense with dead and dying tan oak that, um, and th that is now re-sprouting that it's really problematic for trying to get in there and burn or even do anything. And so um, it's, I guess the recommendation now would have been to uh, pile burn that material and not just leave it on the landscape because it's not, not decomposing. So I d I'm just throwing that out there to the group because we just implemented the project in 2020 and just so much is changing as we're just rapidly, you know, changing our understanding of best practices. I'm super interested in that OAEC um, talk with Brock and others because I think that this group is really at the forefront of you know learning and understanding the best techniques for this work and um, so I'm grateful to be a part of this group and if there's an interest in side conversation about what to do with, about biomass whether 
it's chipping or mastication or lop and scatter or pile burning, like just there's different site specific conditions that we need to be thinking about. And it would be good for land managers to know this in advance so that we're not setting ourselves up for more challenge uh, down the road as we try to keep, you know, dealing with this fuel. So that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Shanti. How about Ron? Hello, Ron. Mute, unmute. There you go. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Ron Rolleri. I'm a director with the Sonoma Resource Conservation District. And I missed the last meeting because uh, I was trying to uh, work on my, I have property up in Trinity County in Weaverville. And just about everybody in town had their insurance canceled as a result of the oh. fire risk. Oh. And I was trying to straighten that out. And then just now I just got interrupted by a phone call from the forester up there. <laughs> So I had to talk to him, but uh, it's just, it's what you see here on a smaller scale, but I'll tell you for the people there, uh, when you lose your insurance on your house, uh, it's pretty scary, you know? And so uh, I tried for 20 years to talk to all my neighbors uh, to get them to clean up. There's, there's a lot of stuff growing in between, you know, both native and, invasive all of a sudden after insurance got canceled everybody's working together <laughs> and and so uh uh including including an insurance office that's also involved they lost their insurance <laughs> but uh so i was just talking about with the a forester for advice about how to who to get to cut the bigger trees because these weeds are getting too tall, like 30 feet or so. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, I've been doing forestry, but not here in Sonoma County, but I've been keeping track of your meetings and playing them back. And I like what we're doing. We're ahead of it. We weren't in the past, but I think we're, I love everything I'm hearing about what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely agree, Ron. Thank you. How about Susan? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Susan Hayden from Sonoma Water. And I also wear a hat as a director of policy and um, legislation with the North Coast Resource Partnership. Um, well, just good to be back with the group. I kind of go in and out, can't always uh, join each month. But a uh, quick update. So just wanted to share that um, through the North Coast Resource Partnership, we hosted back in early May, the governor's wildfire task force meeting. Um, and it was held at the fairgrounds and many of you attended. It was a really successful event, first in-person task force meeting held um, by the governor's um, panel there. And we were, we were very pleased to uh, bring folks together and uh, host that meeting. And then there was a series of tours uh, that next Friday. And I know Dee, I, I held a, a tour uh, and Dee was on, um, participated in that one. And that was really nice to have her along. We went up to Lake Sonoma and uh, talked with the Army Corps about our partnership and fuels reduction work and the upcoming June prescribed burn. Uh, anyway, we had a really great group and um, went to uh, Rancheria Creek and looked at all the restoration work and fuels reduction work that Dry Creek Rancheria has been doing for a number of years and really amazing um, techniques and um, activities going on there. It just, um, I guess, rekindled the need that now uh, many of us are starting to feel comfortable grouping up and doing field tours that how important it is to to meet folks in person and get out on the land again and look at these techniques and um, you know just hearing from Fred and his you know uh, the work he's doing up there and and the biochar work and then Shanti talking about pile burns seem to be be effective I, I just think wow it would be so great to have a a series of field workshops where we can demonstrate some of these um, activities, some of these practices, and talk about when and where it's appropriate 
for those practices. Uh, so folks could, could learn what they are, how they work and why or why not to apply that to your land. Anyway, just a suggestion. Um, I wanted to just share that uh, decision support framework. This is a computer model that um, Sonoma Water and UC Crawford Extension have been working on. We now have a beta version. Your, uh, the forest working group has um, uh, invited us to come and present. Uh, we didn't make it this spring, but we now have some architecture based on all the interviews we did with many of you. And we're at that place where we have a, um, a basic recipe and we now need the feedback and input and we'll, want to test it with your real life applications. So um, I will work with Adriana to um, get us on the agenda and we'd love to just have you uh, look under the hood with us and help us build these tools that can help you. That's the whole point. So we're finally ready to do that. Maybe that's coming up in, say, August, July or August or September, something like that. Um, we'll be taking the next uh, basically year or six months to a year to, to build this and start um, to continue to refine it and build it and get it out so we can start using it. Um, so that is, uh, we're at an exciting place to start really sharing that widely. The other thing I wanted to quickly mention was the work that the Office of Climate Resiliency has been doing at the county level. Um, they've been working on what they're now calling the Sonoma County Climate Resilient Land Strategy, and that's going to that's, that's the a county's view at looking at both private and public lands, the natural and working lands. Um, they now have a public available draft of this strategy. I, I just got an email, I think yesterday afternoon saying it's, it's available for a 30 day comment period due July 15th. So what I'll, as soon as I stop talking, I'll try to put that link into the chat so that if you haven't heard of it yet, you can take a look at it and see if that's something you'd like to make a comment on. And um, I think that I'll stop there. Jay Jaspers was on and he had maybe dropped off. He's really interested in um, hearing from Chief Tuverbill. But I also wanted to just share, if you didn't know, um, our esteemed uh, leader, uh, Jay Jaspers, our chief engineer, is retiring next month, and um, they have just announced his predecessor, who will be Kent Gilfie, um, who has been the deputy chief engineer at Sonoma Water. Mm -hmm. So um, as many of you know, Jay's work has been um, just tremendous in climate science, in engineering, flood management, He's headed up the wildfire task forces locally here, and we're really going to miss him. Yeah. So, but he's he's uh, his work will will live on. And um, anyway, I just wanted to shout out he may join back in. All right, that's all. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Jason Mills, hello. Thanks so much, D. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Yes, we're up here on the Napa Ridge, Jason Mills, contractor for WRA, a fire ecologist, restoration ecologist. And my team and I, we just have been doing a lot of invasive plant work through the Bay. So we wrapped up uh, cheat grass and goat grass control on Mount Tam. We've been doing star thistle and lepidium in the Bay. And now we're jumping into fuel work. And uh, we do ecologically driven ecologically considerate fuel reduction work. And uh, we're starting here on 20 acres of ingress, egress on the Napa Ridge. And then we're jumping into uh, 65 acres on Saddle Mountain in July. And I uh, just wanted to say, love the discussion of best management practices. I put a lot of work into that when I was with the Ecology Center. Now we have a new expanded team here and uh, we're biting off some, some acreage here at, at really reasonable rates. So we can do lop and scatter, you know, not recommended proximate to structures or roadways, but we can do that for between two to 3,000 an acre. 
and then we can do the pile burning and chipping uh, for more like four to five thousand an acre. And uh, I hire local people and pay them li livable wages. So really proud of everything we're doing here. And uh, we're just a resource to help. Um, another cool thing we have is I just got our whole team outfitted with uh, still electric chainsaws. And we have a type six fire engine with us out at the site. So uh, the risk of actually starting a fire while conducting the fuel work are, uh, are mitigated. So <laughs> say for anybody who's uh, looking into learning more about best management practices for fuel reduction, um, the Sonoma County Ag and Open Space District did a great job of compiling some really straightforward protocols that they included in their Saddle, Mar Saddle Mountain uh, proposal. So I think the framework is there and uh, Monica Del Martini is a great resource for that. So uh, keep up all the great work, you guys. You too, Jason. Thank you so much for serving on our steering committee. It's very key. Um, and uh, Bill Miller. Uh, am I unmuted? I'm unmuted. Yes, you are. <laughs> uh, I will show my face because uh, it's been a while since I yes, nice to see these meetings. It's probably been over a year. Yeah. Um, so I see um, old names and new names, but uh, I'm Bill Miller. I work for uh, the Bay Area, Bay Area District um, State Parks and that district includes parks in Napa, Western and um, Southern Sonoma, excuse me, Eastern and Southern Sonoma and down into Marin and San Francisco. Um, but, and personally, I work under the, um, we call it the Cannabis Watershed Protection Program. And what I work on, uh, my main work is remediation and restoration of uh, impacts from cannabis ca cultivation in our parks. So I've been doing a, a number of projects where we're cleaning up, um, fixing old terraced areas, uh, removing a lot of trash and uh, harmful chemicals from our parks. Uh, a lot of this stuff's been sitting out, out there for years. Um, and uh, we haven't found anything new in the past couple of years in my district, which is good. Um, but I've also been able to fund some um, additional work in our impacted watersheds doing project surveys, um, uh, spotted owl surveys and things like that and, and helping to su support some wildlife work. Um, and we just advertised for a um, permanent intermittent uh, environmental scientist position to uh, help support those projects. So if you know anybody that's uh, um, looking to get hired, um, I'm happy to share that information. But in the uh, broader sense of what is uh, might be of interest to the group, um, State Parks has been lucky enough to receive a lot of funding to support wildfire resiliency projects. Uh, so we are going to be doing a ton of projects in the next five years that'll help with access. We're going to be doing fuel reduction and pile burning, some forestry and succession. Uh, we'll be doing some forestry assessments in our parks. Um, we are going to be doing some prescribed fire support work, um, you know, preparing our land so that we can do uh, uh, prescribed fire in the, in the future. Um, we've, and we've actually done, we've done at least one burn I know of it at Jack London in a grassland. So uh, just sort of building our capacity that way. Um, we'll be also be doing some early detection of invasive plants in our um, burned areas and also some post-fire monitoring. So we've got a lot going on and it's fun. Um, and then we also have a complementary program that our facilities uh, is taking on and that's the facilities ignition prevention program. So they're gonna be doing a lot of things to harden our structures and do defensible space um, so that you know, we don't lose buildings, which is, uh, or help to not lose buildings, which is really great. Uh, I attended a presentation yesterday where they rolled out our new wildfire management plan template. And I really like this new template and they really focus on uh, working with the local fire agencies um, as signatories and not just signatories, but as people that provide input into what this, uh, what the plan provides. And um, for people that don't know, 
our wildfire management plans um, can also act as a local operating agreement. So it's essentially it's agreement with um, our local firefighting agencies in terms of you know what their roles are, what our roles are, what we promise to do, what they promise to do, um, where we want to see dozer lines, uh, what are our sensitive resources, um, and what resources we can provide, and, and just all sorts of things like that. So it's it's I think it's a really good thing. Uh, and we'll be going through a process of updating um, uh, some of our plans. Um, I think most of our parks have a plan, but they were written uh, quite a while ago. Um, let's see, so we've also gone through um, our annual resource advisor refresher training. Uh, resource advisors are folks that can work in an emergency incident to provide information about the parks to the people that are responding. And that could be on an oil spill or on a wildfire. Some of us are also then fire line trained. So we can go out on a fire line as a resource advisor and help folks know, um, you know what we might want to avoid um, and what they might wanna know about in terms of responding in our parks. So uh, that's really great. And we've been building our, oh shoot, we only got a few minutes, um, our prescribed fire capacity, uh, mostly in equipment and training, sending people to basic fire and resource advisor training. And we also have our own, um, Burn Boss program. Um, and we'll also be looking to do some new hires in this space. Um, we were looking for a forestry assistant, but uh, it might be um, downgraded to a forestry tech. So, and I think I will leave it at that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for a nice uh, update, uh, Bill. Nice to see you. Um, Ivan, and we, we are uh, hoping you'll be concise and uh, yet be able to tell us all you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm unable to share my video to, today and I will be concise because uh, I don't have a lot to share other than that we're deep into software development right now for our platform to help smaller landowners, property owners get defensible space and home hardening work done. So. Hope to have more to share in the future, but uh, that's uh, the only professional update. I did get uh, participate in the Fire Forward uh, FFT2 training field day back in May. So uh, if you've got a fire line crew that you need, I'll hopefully be able to uh, join your burn in the future. Great. Ivan, what group do you represent? Oh, sorry. Uh, Madronas Wildfire Defense. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much. Now there's last person who's got a phone number here, but maybe they aren't able to be on audio. I'm not sure. 293-6628. If you can speak. That, that's me, D. I just uh, had to switch oh. to the phone. Okay, 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 great. All right. So I think we're still waiting uh, for Mr. Marshall. So uh, I want to make sure that uh, everybody that got a fire prevention grant award got to say their, uh, you know, say their piece so we can congratulate you. The only one I might not have gotten was the Cope Northern Sonoma County. Did that one come through? Did someone talk about that one? I don't think so, Dee. Northern Sonoma Public Evacuation Court, or maybe no one's here to I think do actually um, Marshall can speak to that when he arrives, if, if he has time. I'm okay. pretty sure he was, he, he was instrumental in, in getting that one funded. Um, I, I could speak to the last one. Okay, go for it. So yeah, so the um, Fire Safe Sonoma worked with um, Safer West County and Goldridge RCD to um, develop a proposal called the West County Collaborative Sonoma sorry, West County Collaborative Community Capacity Building Phase 1. Um, it's actually uh, one of three proposals that this group put into the fire prevention, and um, we had proposed all kinds of things, including um, uh, defensible space and a lot of roadside work, actually. But um, what got funded in the end was uh, a, a defensible space incentives program for West County. So for the communities of um, this is all lower, uh, you know, south of the river, but it would be Monterio, Forestville, um, Camp Meeker, and Occidental. Um, residents in those communities could uh, apply for a thousand dollars stipend um, to help them with their defensible space work. Um, 
and we'd be prioritizing uh, low income households. Uh, another uh, really cool part of that of that whole proposal is um, building up our chipper capacity in West County. So in those same communities, we would be um, bringing a chipper to each of the fire departments there. So um, right now it'd be Occidental Fire Department, um, the Gold Ridge Fire Department, which serves Camp, Camp Meeker, Monterio Fire, and then actually giving one more to the county fire that they would, uh, like the, the whole Sonoma County that they could um, bring into uh, West County specifically. So right now the only you know public chippers that serve West County are just the um, county's curbside chipper program, which is a fantastic program, but they're looking to grow it out. And we know that they can't be everywhere all the time. So we, we um, apply to get more chippers into West County specifically. Those may not be in use all the time. So we'll see if we can spread them out a little further, maybe on the north side of the river, we'll see. But, um, but yeah, we're just happy to get more equipment out there. Those will be actually be um, managed and operated by the fire departments themselves. So we'll have fire personnel uh, taking the chippers out to the homes, doing the chipping for residents. Um, and this is just a part of the you know, bigger solution to getting more defensible space work done. Um, that grant will also have some public outreach and education. Um, but yeah, that, that's uh, those three main activities there. And we were awarded just over a million dollars for that proposal. So we're really excited to bring resources out, out to West County. Great, thank you so much. Now let's do a quick uh, Pacific Union College Forest Tour and the Sonoma County Coastal Forest Tour in September. And, and is that, uh, oh, it looks like it's Peter LaCourt, but maybe not, but Fred, you well, Fred. Peter. Peter, let me know he can't make it today, unfortunately, because he had someone on his crew um, get an injury. So he's in the emergency room, <laughs> nothing oh. too big, but he's like, a, you know, he was sad he couldn't make it today. Um, we had just two people signed up for that uh, tour this weekend. And so, you know, unless, unless there's like a, you know, people who forgot to sign up, who want to come and that number is going to raise uh, by the end of the day, I think we will uh, reschedule that event so that we get a better turnout. Um, Peter and I are thinking about like midsummer, early fall. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know what time would be best for all of you to make it, but it's a really great property. It's a fun part of um, Napa. It's just an Angwin, so just over the hill. Um, I really encourage everyone to uh, get out there if you can. Um, so yeah, we'll find another date that hopefully works for more people. Adriana, I would suggest that you do it in the fall um, uh, because of the weather. It's so hot over there. Yeah, I was thinking summer might just be too hot on the mountain. Yeah, anyway, yeah. that's my suggestion. Okay. So what about the, the Sonoma County Coastal Forest Health Tour? Is that Fred? Mm -hmm. We're on. Yep. So right on. Uh, we haven't uh, confirmed, I believe, the 19th with, uh, unless you have, um, with Brendan. But he said that was a good date for him. He's very excited about it. Uh, we have a, um, an itinerary already scheduled uh, in, to work out, and, and it'll be basically starting at Fort Ross and going um, up through Salt Point and tagging, then coming back through Cruise Road to Dendrondel, uh, seeing Seaview Ridge and the, um, the plantation forest, and then getting back to Seaview Ridge above Fort Ross and waving at um, the Coast Ridge, um, larger area, and uh, hopefully Judy can talk to us about that there, and then sneaking back down to Fort Ross for bathrooms and cars. So we feel um, Brendan thinks that's a real good tour and he's very excited to, to talk about it. And he would like uh, forest pathologists on it because he sees it as pine pitch canker, as well as SOD, as well as um, a fire exclusion. So uh, if we can get a bunch of people on that, that would be very exciting. Terrific, terrific. Thank you very much, Fred. And we are really on time. It's pretty great. and. Um, Marshall Turbeville is just tuned in. And Marshall, um, we, I believe, are ready. I want to make sure that there's, uh, do we have anything we have to do for you? Or it looks like uh, 
you're already ready to go. So why don't you just do a brief introduction of yourself? And uh, I know everyone knows you already and has great admiration. And um, so take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to start my video. So hopefully you guys can see me in a little bit. Not that you need to see me. Oh, you can see me now. I'm out yeah, on the yeah, there you are. trees. So. Uh, Marsha Turville, I'm a, a CAL FIRE battalion chief assigned to um, Northwestern Sonoma County, and I'm also with the Northern Sonoma County uh, Fire District, um, which is in Northern Sonoma County. So basically Windsor North, Geyserville area. Um, so I know the Northern one third of the county pretty well, and um, it's an honor to present again to the group this year, kind of giving an outlook. Um, it's not the same old uh, PowerPoint I gave last year. So there's some new information in here and, and hopefully it, my intent more is to have you guys understand fire behavior and be able to make your own uh, judgments when if my outlook my prediction my the potential i see is different and just realize that there's sometimes an hourly outlook where we could have an hour of two of, of bad fire behavior uh versus a, a seasonal or high potential that for the next three months we're going to have you know bad fires uh i'll just cut to the chase i think um i think we're going to of wind events i think we're going to be okay this summer we've been very fortunate as we're seeing right now in june not to have you know major heat waves so anyway i want to present some information go over a little bit of fire behavior and then uh, keep it under 50 minutes or so please so we have some questions uh i am going to show about 20 minutes of what's called north ops's video of their outlook for the summer which talks about la nina and thunderstorm potential and with the 20 lightning series uh, you know and there is some potential for lightning this summer i think it's good um Good to do that real quick. So with that, I'll just get into it. Let me know if uh, the screen's not uh, displaying properly. Um, so just remember fire behavior components. We talk about topography, weather, and the vegetation. I'm substituting vegetation for fuels because usually it's fuels, weather, topography, and just some key key points about topography and fire. Essentially, fire wants to do the opposite of water. So fire wants to burn uphill. And it also wants to be funneled by the wind, that wind being altered by topography. And then weather, the thing about weather, it's all about the wind. And we've seen that our, our most recent destructive fires are primarily wind driven, going back to 2017, uh, 2019, uh, but not so much with 2020. Uh, it was lightning, too many fires at one time, and more of a vegetation or plume dominated fire behavior and, and lack of firefighters. So the last point there is vegetation. Uh, very simple. Uh, vegetation, I, I was going to show you some fancy formula, I think it's in here later. Uh, vegetation either absorbs heat and doesn't ignite. That's why the, the lush vegetation, the watered lawns, they absorb heat, don't ignite. But at some point, vegetation turns to a heat source, meaning it contributes to the fire problem. It changes from a solid to a gas, burns, and produces heat. So that's how vegetation is looked at. And that is what's happening on a daily basis with humidity, water in the area increasing, fog, uh, rain, uh, putting water into our dry vegetation, making it more of a heat sink. And then when it's very warm, very dry, the live fuel moisture in our shimmy species gets to 60%. Now that brush becomes more of a heat source. So it's this kind of a teeter-totter game that can vary hourly or it can vary seasonally. And, you know, we talk about a year-round fire seasons, but it's more prone that we're going to have fires in the summer fire season. Um, I'm using this term bad wildfire because I also think there's good wildfire. Uh, prescribed burning would be an example of, of good wildfire. Uh, you know, uh, Native American use of fire, cultural burning, that's a good wildfire. So I'm, I'm, I'm introducing a new term today, bad wildfire. So first off, good or bad, we need the ignition. Um, I think I've talked about this before. If we never get the ignition, the realization of bad fire weather, bad fuel conditions, are never going to be realized or, or be shown in the fire behavior. So it's all about the ignition at the right time as far as vegetation and, and weather. Um, multiple fires, as the lightning fires were in 2020. Um, the National Fire Danger Rating Indices, so NFDRS is National Fire Danger Rating System Indices. And those are some graphs I'll show you. That's kind of the scientific stuff, like energy release component, the burning index, emission component. Uh, then we have our long-term trends, which obviously is drought, and then what's going on with our whole weather system on a global level with climate, uh, global climate change. We also have those short-term conditions. Um, so in, the, in this county of Sonoma, the ocean, the bay, the low elevations is an example of short-term conditions where one hour it could be really warm, and two hours later it could be foggy and moist. 
And so those are trends versus what I call conditions. Um, temperature, um, as we know, normally peaks in the afternoon. Uh, my observation is many of our fires that resist control are a little harder to contain or like a 3 p.m. start. Now it's kind of getting to be more of a 2 p.m. start, but it's the afternoon fire. Somebody may be mowing at the wrong time of the day or pulling off and dry grass or dragging a chain, something like that. So temperature, air temperature, relative humidity is water in the air, usually driest in the afternoon before we get the sun starting to set or the fog coming. And then we have our wind, which normally we have the afternoon sea breeze, so that cold, cold moist air. But we do know our, our bad fire, most likely bad fire scenario is going to be the offshore event. Um, and then we talk about the vegetation or the fuels. And there's two types of fuel moisture. There's dead fuel moisture, which is uh, fuel moisture less than 30% means it's basically cured. It's been baked. It's ready to be that heat source, not the heat sink. And then there's a live fuel moisture. Um, and we mainly talk about the critical, uh, the species and its critical fuel moisture is 60%, uh, meaning that's when the chemise changes from a heat sink, absorbing the heat, turning into producing heat as part of the fire. Um, all vegetation does something along those lines, but we as firefighters mainly talk about chemise. So this is an example, a fire that already happened this year. Um, I don't know the exact cause, but I would speculate probably a burn pile there, the, the white ash, and you see the other burn pile burning just to the uphill side of that. Um, you know, we can get ignitions any time of the year, but this fire here is burning in green grass. Like you can see it's barely moving. Uh, it's actually burning against the slope, so we call that backing. Um, so we can get year-round ignitions, but this is an example that all fires are not necessarily bad or firefighters can't put out. Uh, the problem kind of is we put too many of them out, so our fuel and vegetation continues to accumulate. And this is also by chance, and I'm going to turn my scanner off, in the uh, Tubbs fire footprint. So, um, you know, there could be some actual reduction in the fuel. So um, that's something about ignition. So um, I'm not going to see questions, uh, Adriana. So if you want to, someone wants to interrupt me to talk about stuff, if you want to prompt me or hit me or just ask, I see some stuff in chat. Maybe there's one thing there. So um, this is getting into the national fire danger rating systems and our daily trends um, every two hours for Cal Fire, our dispatch center, St. Helena, St. Helena puts out what's called the dispatch level. How many firefighters are we gonna mobilize if there's a report of a fire? And sometimes it could be eight fire trucks, sometimes it could be three fire trucks, sometimes it could be no aircraft, sometimes it could just be the helicopter. So Cal Fire tiers the response based upon the potential. And that's one use of the National Fire Danger Rating System. In Sonoma County, we have zone one, zone two, essentially anything west of 101 is the west side zone one. Anything east of 101 is the My Commas zone, and that's zone two. There's a weather station assigned to each zone. So the Hawkeye up near the Geyser Peak, 2,000 feet elevation, is assigned to the My Commas. Um, and the Santa Rosa, uh, Raw's weather station, Fountain Grove, I think it's key site now, was Hewlett Packard. Um, that is showing the, the west side. So if you want to generalize this, and it's, remember, it's classifying large areas, but the west side is basically um, less than 1,000 feet coastal influence. Uh, and I can argue that we know the upper elevations, the, like Oak Ridge weather station, it's very warm, very dry at upper elevation. But so that, but that's how this modeling is done. So, you know, it's not 100% accurate, but it gives a general synopsis. So yesterday, June 15th, 6 p.m. at night, um, you can see, let's pick on my commas. Uh, everything's in high except for the south end, which is not in Sonoma County, really, other than San Pablo Bay. But we would be Cal Fire, we'd be sending eight fire trucks, two bulldozers, all the aircraft that are available locally. Um, and you can see burning in this to 62, a spread component of 14, and an emission component of 43. Uh, you know, these are just numbers. So you've got to kind of know that our numbers, the IC goes from zero to 100. So that means of 43, like matches being thrown into dry grass, or of 100 matches being thrown into dry grass, 43 will create a fire. So it gives us a, a kind of a, representation of potential for spotting, which is always a problem when embers land outside where we're fighting fire and starts a new fire. You can compare that to the central zone there to 97. So that's a much higher potential of a, a spot fire happening in the uh, central zone, which is mainly Napa County, Lake County of yesterday at this time. But the spread component and the burning index don't have a, an upper end. So they go to zero to infinity. And so I'm gonna throw out this number 250, the 200s, we get to a BI of 200, that, that's like, wow, that, that's a bad day. So this is kind of you know, a way that firefighters, or if you hear about this, you listen to the radio, 
Um, we can characterize the hourly, the, the short-term trend, um, but there's also some inherent seasonal trends in here too, because a lot of these uh, indices are driven by drought, uh, warm weather, you know, multiple hours of warm, dry weather. So you would see if we get a, a high pressure setting up, a two week heat wave, all these values would go up because the vegetation is being dried out. And so we get easier starts, we get better burning, more heat production. So it's represented here in these national fire danger readings. Um, but this is sometimes with the graph you're going to see maybe in the press Democrat. If a reporter calls me and I try to get all scientific with them and explain stuff. And, you know, this was some of the doom and gloom I think I kind of portrayed at last year's meeting. Um, but let me tell you, this is looking really good right now. And I can just look at this and see it because I live this stuff every day. So let me do my best to explain this to you. Um, across the bottom, I think it's fairly easy to see that's the calendar year from January 1st to December 31st. It's this year, 2022. Um, on the y-axis up and down there on the left side of the screen is the energy release component, um, ERC. Um, that's a composite of, of values. It's just like the spread component of the BI. It takes all this stuff together, models it, weights it, and it spits out a value of how much energy is going to be released, how much resistance to control, and the overall, you know, over a large geographic area, not just like a one acre area, uh, what the potential is going to be. And so you can see it now in, in three different colors where the gray line is the average over, I think it's about 20 or so years. Uh, so that's the gray line. The red line is the max value for, for that specific date. So this is today's June 16th. This graph is for June 14th. So all the June 14ths that have happened over the last 30, 20 years, however, since this data has been collected, that is the highest value for that day. So that's why you see these real jagged up and down spikes. It's not, the red line is all one year. No, it's the maximum reported ever for that day. And so if you look at, well, let me finish talking and I'll explain how this makes sense then. So then you look at the, the blue line, that's this current year. So that's what we, how we're progressing this year. So when it, the blue line dips really low, like in late April, uh, early, uh, mid part of February, a rain event happened, Vegetation gets wet, our ERCs tank, they drop, which is great. Less fire potential, great for prescribed burning, great for pile burning. Um, so now when you look at this graph, and is my mouse going to, my arrow going to show up on my screen with you guys? Yes. So you see this blue line right here, D, above the red line? Yes. The graph, that's going to be the new red line. So you read the paper, I was quoted late March, you know, we're two months ahead of, ahead of where we should be. We're in record setting territory. Basically, our uh, late March, early February values, if you draw a straight line across, would normally in the average year happening um, this time of year, sometime in June. So we were two, two months ahead of schedule, early fire season. But then you see the, our, our year, 2022, the blue line, it dropped. Rain happened, we got moisture, and it, it dropped. It actually dropped below the gray line, the average line. And we stayed below average until um, mid part of May or early part of May. And then we had another heat wave and we went back up to almost record setting. We got more rain. We dropped back down to average. And you can see now in this current year of 2022, the blue line, we're actually below average. So that's a good thing. We're like uh, now a month behind average. Uh, that doesn't, I guess, draw headlines and big attention. But the sense I'm getting, you know, maybe you're watching the news and stuff about June. We're not getting like major heat waves. We're getting two or three days of warm weather. Don't get me wrong. We could have a bad fire. We've already had some fires back down by Sonoma Raceway. We can have something really bad happen. But we're, I, I just don't see us getting a fire that's going to burn for seven days that we can't catch. You know, if it gets windy, yeah, we're going to have a problem. But if we continue what we're doing now of not having these extreme long-term heat waves, if we don't have wind, um, you know, we're going to kind of go back to maybe a season like early 2000s where no one really talks about it. It was, yeah, we had some fires. Um, so that's kind of, you know, my spider senses doing prescribed burning, watching how things are burning, but don't get me wrong. There are some parts of our county right now that are above average conditions. There's also some parts that are really well below average. There's still green grass on some of those sites and then need trees. This is uh, all in Northern, uh, our part of Northern California, what we're looking at. Um, and then these horizontal lines, this is the 90th percentile. So by mathematical statistics, only 10% of the time do we get conditions above this horizontal gray line. And then this is the 97th percentile, which means statistically and mathematically, we only get 3% of our time up here above that line. So it's kind of playing the stats. Is this a 1% day? Is this a, a you know, 
an average day, a 50% day, and these are the general trends. So uh, if you look up here in the upper left, our current value is 30.5. You can see that right down here. If you draw it across, 30.5. Um, and it uh, doesn't give our, our average value, but normally average would be closer in the upper 30s or 40s. We get some heat waves. Remember, just longer days and everything else. This, this blue line is in general going to trend up, or just like we see the average line happening. Um, and so that's kind of how to read these graphs, energy release. Okay. So something to really pay attention to if you want to look at the regional Mendocino County, Sonoma County, Marin County, um, you know, what, what our overall global regional conditions are, not necessarily site specific. Um, and then a lot of this is driven by how dry are dead, dead. So think about dead, not live plants. This is the, the log laying out in the forest. Don't get a lot of rain. The ground doesn't get wet. Um, it just doesn't have the, the exposure, the time to collect water. And so it's more cured, more available to burn. It's that heat source, not the heat sink. And so this is the 100 hour or 1,000 hour. So great, the big logs, greater than three inches. Um, same values or same representation. Gray is average. Red is the lowest ever. This is like inverted. So lower means drier. Our 90th percentile, 97th percentile. So you can see right here, as of two days ago, June 14th, for our thousand hour fuels at a big regional scale, we have, they're wetter than they would average be for this time of year, which is another good sign that if our big logs don't catch fire, that's less heat, that's less resistance to control, less water we need, uh, less heat being produced in a forest environment that then gets up in the lower limbs, the ladder fuel gets them to be a crown fire. So also great time to be prescribed burning when you see values like this. So uh, that's another graph to look at. There's a hundred hour graph, there's other graphs too, but I pretty much look at the thousand hour graph and uh, we, this is at the North Off Predictive Services website, which is where I'm gonna show you the video from. Uh, so you can look at the thousand hour and you can look at the energy release component. Uh, so that was thousand hours dead. Now let's talk a little bit about our live fuel moisture. Remember we talked about chemise, I assume it's spelled both ways with an A or an E there in the third letter. Uh, and this is out of Mendocino County, Cow Mountain, just because right now, uh, locally, we're not doing a very good job of uh, every so often recording our live fuel moisture. So this is the live plant now of chemise, uh, where we cut it and weigh it, put it in an oven, dry it out, weigh it again. And you can see for the one reading that Mendocino County's done, uh, about June 15th, which is why I selected this as the most current reading. Uh, the green line is the average line. And so we're right pretty much on average. And if you watch the average line, it goes down, down, down. September 1st, our fall fire season, our wind driven fires. This is when all those things start coming into alignment. The only variable is going to be is how warm it's going to be, how windy it's going to be. And on the good side, when are we going to get our first rains? Um, that's when it gets down into the storm and sea and very dry. Uh, you can compare this to past years. So the lower the line, the worse conditions. So the red line is the lowest ever recording. There's 2021. Last year, you can see we were below last year, consistently trending well below. Then in 2020, um, did a big dive here. I don't know why these lines don't continue out, but you get the general idea that in 2020, 2022, we're slightly above average. And my assumption is going to be it's going to be the same general trend that sometime in late August, September, we're going to be down here at the 60%, the critical um, live fuel moisture of the species we monitor, which is chemise, our brush. So the brush, when it hits 60, goes from being a heat sink to more of a heat source, contributes more to the fire problem. Here's, you know, big, big modeling. Right, not very site specific to Sonoma County of what the Climate Prediction Center is saying um, from our area. So somewhat good news if you like to gamble with equal chances, but it's definitely not being shown as above, at least for right now, as far as temperature, which is, that's good news. If we can have any good news, I guess it would be best to be in water, more in the white. And I'm, I'm kind of reading that wrong because the, tan, the tannish color here is a leaning above slightly. So better chances are we like statistics, it's better to be in the white, but at least we're not in the red. If you look at precipitation, uh, equal chances for us, it'd be nice to be in the above. And this is uh, showing the monsoonal, uh, increased monsoonal uh, predictions that are occurring for this year, which um, right now I think this area of our country needs that, but not as bad as what Idaho and Montana are currently getting. Um, so this is showing above uh, chances. So these are updated 
roughly once a month if you guys monitor it at um, the Climate Prediction Center. Here's something a little more uh, regional for the West uh, West Coast, and you can see our county line here too. And this is seems to be what the media, like the Press Democrat, others look at this um, this graph. Um, and, and we've seen a lot worse for our area. We've seen us be in that really dark uh, red, almost looks like brown. We've also been in the B3. But right now we're being shown in severe drought, um, which is over here um, in our county. And our neighboring counties are being shown in that as well. Kind of surprising, I believe Humboldt right now is getting some rain, but they're still being shown in severe drought too. So uh, this is no surprise to anybody here today that you know we're in a drought, this is representing that. Um, so that this is updated over on tomorrow as well. So um, I'm gonna play this video. This is something you guys can get um, online at this North Oxford Predictive Services. I don't know, maybe you've seen it, um, but it's 20 minutes. I feel it's a good use of 20 minutes, um, but I'm expecting this is the first year that they've done this. They're doing this about the first of every month, which is great. And it's more than just, you know, well, good or bad, it's more than just our area, but it also looks out to, um, La Nina, El Nino, uh, monsoonal patterns, like what the general uh, feeling is for our area. Um, to me, it's a little valuable too, because, you know, as long as we have a lot of firefighters locally that aren't, you know, at the Dixie fire for like three months last year, or the Caldo fire, wherever it may be, um, you know, if we want to stop fires, and unfortunately we're in the fire stopping business, um, it's going to maybe show that we should have firefighters to stop fires. So I'm going to let this play. Hopefully if it's a there's too much of a time delay. It's not effective. Someone just from, you know, tell me in chat or, or say something and we'll just stop it. I have about another 30 slides after this. I still think I'll be able to keep it at 50 minutes, um, but I'm going to let it play. Um, I hope when the audio is going to work, it might be a little bit for me to set that up. You guys hearing the sound? No. Not, not yet. I think what you'll need to do, Marshall, is... Um, I, I, did, I did share sound. Oh, sound. yeah, we hear it now. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Welcome to a significant fire potential outlook for June through September 2022. The webcam. The sound went off. Gas will be broken into three parts, setup ingredients, expected weather patterns, and overall expectations. The first section will go over several setup conditions that are applicable to either current or past conditions. They can give a glimpse into future fire season trends and severity, although future weather conditions can change the setups in a short period of time. Despite some unsettled weather with the jet stream dipping south at times, May precipitation was below to well below normal across the majority of the region. Near to above normal precipitation returns were found across the north coast. Average temperatures were split with cooler than normal readings across the north and generally near to a little above normal across the south. Water year precipitation remains below normal across the majority of the area, excluding portions of the east. Average temperatures from October to May are near average with a tad cooler hint across the north and a little warmer across the interior. Long-term drought conditions remain pretty steady state from late April to late May although a slight improvement occurred across Del Nor County due to the precipitation that fell there. Drought conditions worsened across central and southern California. The Evaporative Demand Drought Index, or EDI for short, helps to capture shorter-term drought fluctuations. EDI represents the thirst of the atmosphere. In the ingredients such as temperature, wind, solar radiation, and humidity anomalies, can impact fuel conditions. This one month eddy graphic calculated at the end of May shows where the highest stress fuel due to short-term drought conditions is likely to be. Most of the greater Bay Area and Sacramento Valley foothills is under some sort of stress condition and lines up well to where the recent large fire activity has occurred the past two weeks. Since we are talking setup ingredients, it is always nice to give some historical context. 
comparison graphics of the one-month eddy since 2018 for late May is used to frame this context. Current values appear to be somewhat unique compared to the previous four years, although there are some similarities to the three big fire years of 2018, 20, and 21. Moisture found within the snowpack lowered from 30 to 40 percent of normal in late April to 5 to 15 percent in late May. The current readings compared to the previous six years is right in line with low snowpack years of 2018, 20, and 21. The Tahoe Donner Alert wildfire webcam, which sits near 7,800 feet, shows the dramatic change in snowpack between late April to late May. Fuels are now prematurely exposed to the sun's drying energy across most elevations. Following a topsy-turvy April in regards to dead fuel moisture trends, more significant drying occurred across most areas during May. The current North Ops 1,000 hour dead fuel moisture value indicated by the blue line on the left graphic, shows unusually dry values as of May 31st. The energy release component indice, which is comprised of various dead fuel moisture values and KBDI, but largely determined by 100 and 1,000 hour readings, is above normal, substantiating unusually dry conditions across the region. Based on the projected weather patterns, unusually dry dead fuel should continue most areas during most of June. Herbaceous curing has accelerated further up the slopes compared to April, with mostly cured annual and perennials below 2,500 feet, but excluding the north coast where periods of precipitation has kept the perennials greener. These trend photos from two webcam locations, east of Yuba City, and the North Bay showed the dramatic carrying between late April and late May, just shy of 2,500 feet. Some sort of green up state is found between 2,500 to 7,000 feet, depending on exposure to the sun. Pictures taken in late May from various alert wildfire webcams with different elevations show the area caught in a varied herbaceous green up state. Curing will work its way up the slopes as June progresses. There is a much clearer picture in the herbaceous fuel loading across Northern California compared to projections during March and April. Near to above normal loadings will be found across the area favoring the Sacramento Valley foothills, Greater Bay Area, and portions of Northeast California and the Far East Side. The picture illustrates the heavier grass growth along the shoulder of Highway 299 east of MacArthur on May 18th. Two locations that do forage sampling in the Sacramento Valley Foothills PSA indicate near 20% above normal forage loadings based on 40 to 50 years of collection. Shrubs are currently in a mixed flammability state with some species taking on moisture while others are drying or curing and becoming more flammable. This graph illustrates moisture trends in sage across Northeast California. Both sample sites indicate that the moisture content has peaked and is trending lower with one site above normal and another site below normal compared to average. The sampling is following the historic moisture curve and should become more flammable later in June. Chemise fuels found across the lower elevations are increasingly becoming more flammable. There are some wild card fuel conditions found across the region that will contribute to additional flammability. During late December, a series of strong winter storms affected Northern California and created large areas of blowdown across Nevada, Placer, and El Dorado counties, as well as across the Six Rivers National Forest in Humboldt County. Lots more laddering of the fuel bed will occur in these blowdown areas and contribute to more efficient transfer of heat and spotting. The long-term drought conditions built up over the past few years has increased observed mortality in the forest. The picture on the right was taken near Donner Pass this past winter 
and the red needle trees are very apparent. In summary, long-term drought conditions remain across the majority of the region with a short-term drought signal showing up across the Greater Bay Area and Sacramento Valley foothills. Dead fuel moistures are unusually dry and will generally remain unusually dry during the next several months. The alignment of flammable, herbaceous, and live woody fuels has become delayed some due to the recent cooler than normal temperatures favoring the north but some alignments are starting to show up across the lower elevations and is linked to the recent large fire activity. Areas of the region experienced significant blowdown during December storm events and tree mortality due to long-term drought is increasing across the landscape. We will now shift gears and talk about the expected weather patterns during the next four months. The two main teleconnections, or coupled oceanic and atmospheric forcing mechanisms, will likely remain to be La Nina, with the enhanced trade winds and cooler sea surface temperatures across the eastern equatorial Pacific, as indicated by the three-month anomaly loop and a negative Pacific decadal oscillation, which is represented by the arc of cooler than normal water found off the North American coast and the warmer than normal water to the west. These teleconnections are most likely to alter the jet stream track in high and low pressure positions during June and September or the summer transitional periods, but they will provide some forcing during the summer months. Past analog years, that contain similar teleconnections to the current atmospheric oceanic state provide higher confidence outlooks, especially in the first one or two months. Choosing the appropriate analog years is as much art as science since global climate change has likely altered the interaction of these teleconnections, thus impacting how global circulations behave. The Madden-Julian Oscillation, or MGO, is an equatorial phenomenon that is hard to predict several weeks in advance and generally has less influence during the summer months, but is a consideration to look at during the next four months. Confidence is moderately high that La Nina will continue through the summer into the fall. June appears to be pretty similar to May with some jet and trough cool intrusions with some moisture, but generally drier overall. The composite analog upper level pattern suggests troughing over the western tier of the U.S. The latest CPC monthly forecast for May suggests near to below normal precipitation, and the predictive service outlook calls for a more solid below normal signature. CPC and predictive service forecasts indicate mixed temperature anomaly signals. Lightning will continue to be associated with some of the trough passages with typical alternating northerly and westerly enhanced dry wind flows. One of the analogs suggests a slightly stronger wind speed signal for the region. Confidence remains high for an unusually strong southwest monsoon signal with the weather plume spending more time west of the Continental Divide and across the southwest third to half of the U.S. This is especially seen in the predictive service forecast. CPC continues to show an above average precipitation signal across portions of Arizona from July through September. It is likely that the North Ops region will be on the edge of these semi-permanent heavier moisture plumes during July, which means a better chance for some significant fire ignitions and growth. It should be noted that some of the analog years suggest a more developed offshore low, which would be one ingredient to a healthier monsoon push into Northern California. Some of the analog years are suggesting more Pacific trough influences during August, which would shift the more robust monsoon signal further east. This is indicated in the latest predictive service precipitation outlook. Marine cooling across the near coastal areas is more likely to occur under this scenario, but remember, analogs are most useful during the first one to two months.
The monsoon signal is expected to weaken earlier than normal during September with a mix of dry trough passages and unusual warmth due to ridging in between the troughs. This predictive service forecast suggests warmer than normal temperatures and near to below normal precipitation. The expected four month weather pattern suggests mixed temperature anomalies and near to below normal precipitation. There will likely be less extended heat wave events compared to last year. Critical wind patterns appear to be normal overall, with changeable northerly and onshore wind flows during June and less potential for northerly winds during the summer, but returning during September. Lightning is likely to accompany some Pacific trough passages during June. The summer monsoon season is expected to be robust across the southwest this year and is likely to impact California more during July versus August. The next section will cover the overall fire season expectations within the four-month outlook period. As curing and flammable live and dead fuel alignments grow, a larger above-normal footprint is found across Northern California during June. Normal large fire activity is represented by one to two large fires per PSA. Lightning from passing Pacific troughs is always a big wild card during this month, and it'll be crucial since the flammable fuel alignments should be found across most low <clears throat> and mid elevations up to 5,500 feet or so. The mid elevations will have more alignments later in the month as herbaceous and generally shrub fuels cure. Above normal significant fire potential remains across the majority of the region during July and August with lessening risk along the near coastal influenced areas. July and August is represented by one to five large fires per PSA, but the Bay Area PSAs observe less than one. Monsoon moisture surges will be the big wild card during this period, although it's likely to occur with more frequency across Northern California during July versus August. The current thinking is that fuel and weather pattern elements would align to create heightened significant fire potential across all the area during September. Typically, one to three large fires occurs within each PSA, although less than one occurs across the Far East Side and Bay Area PSAs. In summary, the large fire season has set in across the low elevations with additional flammable fuel alignments working up the slopes during the next couple of months. Monsoon surges are expected to provide some lightning ignition issues, more so during July versus August can't rule out a so-called lull period during August, but fuels should be unusually dry during this period in most areas. September looks to be active based on the current weather and fuel projections. The national fire season will likely be active again this year. Several important ingredient setups and expected critical fire weather patterns are in play for several geographical coordination center areas during the next four months. This concludes the North Ops four month significant fire potential web. I was just kind of give you guys like more of a global regional view. Um, and I take that as you look at some of these, you know, this is their monthly prediction on June, uh, June 1st. There's been a couple of weeks since that video was put together. And you've seen some of the weather that even was called for in that video hasn't really materialized, specifically lightning uh, or red flag type wind events. We definitely have wind, just not the humidity and temperature to make it a red flag. So that's uh, the four month video. Every month then a report like this is put out. So there'll be another one coming up on July 1st. And uh, we're in the, in the NC02 uh, PSA and our threshold to be above it, you know, our threshold is one major fire. Major fire is like a thousand acres or more. Uh, maybe, it's high, maybe it's a different threshold now as far as acres, but it's one major fire. So we have a very low threshold in our PSA. So other areas have higher thresholds, like three to five big fires. So that's why we get into the above normal pretty quick if there's a prediction that we could have at least one big fire in our term. Um, I was just going to put this out there about the fire season term and how Cal Fire is kind of redefining it. And I'm more focusing on the summer fire season. And then we know there's a high tendency on fall fire season after that August potential break in activity in August. Uh, really when we get a real dry, dry fuel moisture coupled with dry dead fuel moisture, wind events. And one thing really in our benefit is shorter days, less sun, less solar radiation, uh, and, you know, and you don't set rain. So that's fire season defined. 
some other terms like containment and control. Contain is basically very simple. It means it's no longer spreading uh, versus control it means it's out. We are not stopping the fire. So it's really, to me, confusing because we'll say the fire is 40% contained or 40% controlled. And everyone thinks, oh, well, it's still burning. No, it's not really still burning. We're just not controlled yet. So these terms get used interchangeably. Uh, just know that when we say the fire is controlled, it usually means we are no, no, no longer firefighters on the fire. We feel confident enough um, to, to walk away from it. So we, we work on containment, stop the edge, and then eventually we control. Quick review, this was in last year's as well. Um, you know, ignition, fire line intensity, and greatest stress. The three fire behavior terms that all make a bad fire. And if you look at it through the, the lens of temperature, weather, vegetation, or temperature, weather, fuels, all of these things are all in that fuels category. And so that's why it's so important to look at are we getting our normal rainfall? Are we in drought? How long are heat waves are we getting? How much is the sun going to hit an area? Do we have shaded fuel breaks or bare uh, shaded fuel breaks? We always want shaded fuel breaks. And then the very thing at the bottom is the rate of spread. And we, we know that wind is the most dominant driver, but if a fire goes from a forest to a grass fuel type, it's going to speed up. And the steeper the slope, it's going to speed up. And so when all those things, and the firefighter term is called alignment, when wind aligns with slope, so wind blowing up a slope with dry vegetation, specifically grass is our fastest fuel, that's when we get a lot of acreage. And I'm going to talk about fuels, breaking up fuels here in a minute. So three ways to look at three conditions we need. So I'm just going to give you from last year. Here's a mower caused fire in the Alexander Valley, June. You can see the indices, emission component, this would be in the Maya Commons area, spread component, which is feet per minute ahead of the fire, not that great, we get a fire. Um, and it burns into that vineyard, the vineyard, vineyard essentially stops it. So that's an effective barrier. In this case, a vineyard, some of our vineyards are, are no-till or not low. We just had uh, three acres of a vineyard burn on Memorial Day because it wasn't low, probably damaged the vines. Um, here's an example of what wind does. And this picture in the background is the, everyone knows about the Dixie fire from last year. But on day 22 of the Dixie fire, it made it to 274,000 acres. Well, if you look at the first, 12 hours of the Cedar Fire in 2003, almost the perfect ignition, the perfect spot, really strong Santa Ana winds, it burned that amount of acres in 12 hours. So that is a you know, different field type two, forest versus brush. Um, but Dixie Fire, 22 days, Cedar Fire, 12 hours, same amount of acres. So the fast moving fires burn homes, you can't get around them. Um, the more the fuels controlled fires, the prune dominated fires like the Dixie, um, just so much heat being produced is more of a problem. So we just kind of have different tactics. But last year is an example, the same exact day, a fire over in the foothills. This is the area where they're talking about snow. Um, and in the, in the horizon here of this, uh, this photo, you see actually see the Dixie fire. Um, this is a fire that happened in a really aggressive firefighter attack, a lot of uh, airplanes and everything else. And uh, basically 2,600 acres were in that whole canyon there uh, and very little smoke the next day. So, uh, that's what's made our problem, all those fuels, right, that didn't burn or potentially didn't burn, now we're there for, to burn. So aggressive initial attack. Here's an example last year of a fire that happened in a very remote area, uh, east of Berryessa, so kind of in that middle of nowhere, or it's in Berryessa on Highway 16. Um, it burned in 2018 in the county fire. Um, and, and so it took firefighters a while to get there. You can see the red stuff is where air tankers make drops, but because it had been burned so frequently, because it burned before in some of the drums of fires, Within about two hours, an hour and a half, it goes from the photo on the left, which is about the time of detection, to the photo on the right. Um, and you know, this is starting to be the effect of our areas burning so frequently, too. So just an example of that. Um, here's something back in Sonoma County. Um, afternoon fog wind. I think there was a couple fires, maybe five or six fires that started on Todd Road. So the wind was blowing essentially perpendicular from the south to the north. So fire starts along Todd Road, burning towards Lano Road. Uh, the lower left there shows the pre-existing conditions. You know, if you Google Earth or something like that, you can see the field there that's grazed or used for hay. And then we looked at when the fire happened last year, uh, August 10th, uh, went, went 50 acres really quick, but it basically stopped at that field that had been grazed or mowed. So these uh, showing the example here, the, the mowing area, you're still leaving the tons per acre there. You're just changing it from a vertically oriented grass to a horizontal grass, which burns differently, that horizontal continuity. Uh, fuel loading um, variable, 
Uh, but here, the, the grass is actually probably baled and hauled off site. So the fire hit that area. In some areas, it didn't even burn, really. I mean, you can see where the winds were the strongest is where it got in there with braided fingers, but essentially stopped it. So grazing, weed eating, all these are effective vegetation management techniques. You don't need to go to bare dirt or spray a bunch of chemicals. Uh, so another just different angle that I'm going to speed it up for time. Uh, here's the fire in the south part of the county. You can see the indices, nothing crazy. August 13th, about noon, uh, wind-driven fire, a lot of smoke, which tells you that there's moisture still in the vegetation mid-August. Another fire that was put out real quickly by firefighters. Uh, not did not turn into a tubs fire or a wind driven fire like this in K. But you can see the smoke is really hovering low to the ground. So that shows you very strong winds. And you also see the fog bank out to the west. So you also see some moisture. Here's an example where we just have too many fires at one time. Luckily, this was at night. This was September 6th. Um, but this is, you know, replicating kind of what lightning does to us. But these were all along roads. Um, at nighttime, you know, not very dry, not windy, um, but fires around Hillsburg. So then uh, here's another fire, wind driven fire with Ember. It's got a new eucalyptus tree down in the Pengrove area. Uh, so it starts, this is a, a picture of when it started about 115. Um, I must have not put the other slides in, but it basically spotted and uh, created like three separate fires. Um, here's the fire near the Napa Sonoma County line. Another example, having a large helicopter at Napa County Airport that got on this fire really quickly. Um, it, it was put out. You guys didn't hear about it in the grass fire. And so here's showing you basically a, a photo from the camera. It's about an hour apart, 116 acres, one hour. And with grass, there's not a lot of residual burning or smoldering. Um, usually not a lot of spotting in grass either. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of sustained heat. So it's one hour. So that's what I'm going to say. My, my feeling is not a lot of bad fires this year, but we are going to get these one or two hour fires primarily in grass or really by, by just the way it is, is that firefighters can't mobilize quick enough to stop the spread. These are too many fires, um, remote areas, poor access, uh, maybe aircraft got holding in check for us. And so we're gonna get these bad afternoon fires. Um, after that, I'm, I'm not, unless there's really strong winds, I think we're gonna have more of our average fires since summer fires. Then we were very fortunate last year to have what, 10 inches of rain on November 23rd, or maybe it was October, we start seeing our, our green grass again, less likely to burn. Indices are low. And then for the rest of the year, we pretty much didn't have a fire. But if you're paying attention, Colorado, not so lucky. Uh, fire not named after me, but I won't forget the name of it. The Marshall Fire and the Middle Fork Fire. Um, Wind-driven fire gets into homes. This is an area just like 2018 with the, um, the Paradise Campfire, an area that probably would have snow on some of these areas would be cooler, but this area of Colorado, and I talked to some folks in Colorado this year, goes record heat, very dry, and now they get the wind coming off the, uh, not the Sierra Nevada, but the, the Rockies, and they get this fire that happens. So what's unique about this, if you look at, I'm going to skip through this, some of the stuff, but this kind of goes into my one bad afternoon scenario that shows their, you know, plus 21, plus 19 around Christmas, all this record heat all of December, and then they get a wind-driven fire. Very similar to what we've got <clears throat> In, uh, in 2017 here locally, remember there was a bad fire in Ventura County called the Thomas Fire that year. And all the records that Sonoma County set in a bad way in 2017 were then all redone by the campfire in 2018. And then what's crazy is a day later, it snows. So you can see the homes are smoldering, um, the snow covering. So if you look at our, what happened in 2021, if you look at all these stats, these are all the CAL FIRE units, lines for each CAL FIRE unit. Uh, Total acreage burn, 984,000 acres. Uh, about 98% of that acreage was the Dixie fire, one fire. So firefighters are really good, put out most fires, but one, one fire burns 98% of the acres last year. Another fire called the Fawn Fire burns about another 1%. So it's these single event, large fires that are accumulating a lot of our acreage. Remember, this is Cal Fire jurisdiction only, not the forest, uh, the National Forest Service, National Park Service. Um, and then you can kind of see the acreage was not anything last year, really in Cal Fire jurisdiction, only a couple, I'd say only a couple, but only a couple hundred thousand acre difference. So I'm not going to go through this. You guys have probably seen it, but all of our really bad fires have happened in the last 20 years. And Sonoma County is pretty well represented on these graphs. I, every year I go through the, the, the top 20 in all these categories. 
And so these are the largest. We added the Dixie, the monument, the Caldor, and the river complex are the largest. Uh, we added the Dixie and Caldor to the most destructive. And I'm going to say this is good news, uh, but it's never good news when people die. But we had no changes to the 20 deadliest uh, fires. So it shows really we're doing a really good job about evacuating, getting people prepared, um, make decisions without waiting for official government notifications, uh, maybe defensible spaces working, maybe fuel breaks along, uh, evacuation routes are working. Uh, but we've had no changes to the 20 deadliest. And if you look, um, I don't mean to like just talk about this just purely numbers because six lives is a lot, but the, the basically six lives is the lowest value. Okay, eighty five is the campfire. Um, and you can see there with the Tubbs fire we had twenty two, and then that Cedar fire that burned two hundred seventy thousand acres in twelve hours. The fast moving fire was fifteen. So uh, what I'm noticing when I look at this is when I would have showed you this graph before, I wouldn't have the month of June. Um, so now that's really showing the early fire season. So now we've had a largest fire starting in June. Uh, so that's on there now. It's not the most destructive, not the deadliest, but now there's, uh, what, seven months of representation in the largest, uh, six months of representation in the most destructive, and about five months of representation in the deadliest. And so it still appears that October, uh, maybe historically we used to get rain in September and October, uh, that is like our, our bad month for homes burning unfortunately people dying but the largest fires start earlier in the year probably lightning or remote you can see lightning 8.5 at the top 20 and so you can kind of see these trends um, if you talk about all all across the state what's going on so i'm going to kind of wrap it up next three minutes um, this is just very quickly just some broad brush approaches if you want to look at how grass burns burns quick less numbers less heat less long-range spotting brush is kind of finicky it either burns as a head fire um, which is worst case, um, or it burns just a litter underneath it and makes little short finger runs, um, but it is fast moving when driven. Um, and then the forest fires, I break it down into two types. The fire that stays on the surface of the earth, which is what we want with our shaded fuel brights and fuels work. Um, it's pretty slow, uh, shielded from the wind, um, less likely to have long range spotting. You know, almost opposite of that is the, uh, I would call that a good fire. Opposite of that is the bad fire, the crown fire. That's the worst case fire scenario for us. A lot of heat, a lot of embers. Um, not really, we're, we're not really effective against them. So weather real quick um, and fuel moisture. We are seeing more and more now of 4% uh, for our fuel moisture out of some of our weather stations. This is the, the snooper service. Um, you can look at it. And so we're seeing low values, 4%, 3% you see on here. There's some 2% on here in Lynn County at Middle Peak. We are seeing low values. This happens to be 10 o'clock at night in July 10th of last year. So all this daytime drying seasonal trend, we're now seeing in all, how dry our dead fuels are at, at our weather stations. So the weather creates two types of fire, the wind-driven fire, like the cedar fire, more the wind-dominated fire, like the Dixie fire, um, and, and our 2020 lightning fires. Um, I just want to give you guys a quick update on some changes to the, the zoning for the National Weather Service. We saw this last year where there was a red flag for the North Bay Mountains, but then they called out the Napa County Mountains and the Eastern Sonoma County Mountains. And so what Sonoma County or what the National Weather Service has done now is break the mountains up. So those mountains that you just saw in the previous slide are now zone five. Coastal Sonoma County Mountains are 503, and then Mount Cam and Marin County Mountains are 502. So there's going to be much more focused red flag areas. And 506 is our valleys, not right adjacent to the coast less than thousand feet. So you're going to see much more targeted red flag warnings this year, um, not just being all the mountains. And so the East Bay, South Bay has the same thing, but we're only talking about Sonoma County here. So that's a change this year, some changing terminology to listen for for that, the 503, the 504, 506. Um, and just a reminder about red flags and fire watches. Always expect a, a, a fire weather watch to be upgraded or changed to a red flag warning. That's all based upon how much time and confidence. It's not that the weather service like freaked out and messed up or something you should be concerned about. Someone blew the, blew it, blew the forecast. It just means we can't make a red flag warning, warning more than 48 hours before the onset. So expect always a fire weather watch to go to a red flag. And this is the criteria and why we haven't had one yet is because we haven't our, had, had low fuel moisture yet. So our 10 hour fuel has got to get below 6%. And then we have to have eight hours of sustained wind, which is another tricky thing. We don't always get eight hours. And essentially, the stronger the wind, 
the less uh, drying that you need, less RH. You need. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but this is the number of red flags per month over the last so oh, last roughly 15 years. And I'm going to, this is some repeat slides from last year about the high pressures. It's all about where the highs on those are. This is our two week heat wave when a high pressure sets up, it's trapping by low pressures to the east and west. And we just get that air being forced down on us, dries everything out. We've got clouds, so clouds, moisture in the air helps pull the heat in, which is why Sonoma County stays warmer than Lake County. Um, why, usually in general, we see fires in Lake County go out at night because it gets so darn cold, um, but we don't have that always in Sonoma County. Uh, here's the inside slider, and this kind of gets into some of the weather and north winds and how the jet stream sets up. But this is, if you hear about the inside slider, we get wind, we get fire, and then it's cold afterwards. So this is kind of our fall, our fall, you know, fall weather scenario, our, our cold front passage, it may be called. But if you hear about an inside slider, you know, the low comes down that Nevada, California border. Here's our lightning um, coming up the monsoon. My last slide, I'll talk about lightning west of Mount Tam is what I consider our biggest threat for lightning caused fires. This is what it looked like in 2020 uh, with the uh, lightning complex and the two major fires in Sonoma County, the, the Walbridge and the Myers. No one talks about all the other fires, firefighters put out, but these were the two that did it um, and you know, it caused destruction. So there's that moisture boom coming up, entering Sonoma County on the west side of, uh, of Mount Tam. And then the nocturnal drying event is another weather phenomenon. You've heard me talk about this where upper elevations of uh, Sonoma County stay warm and dry, like the coastal Sonoma Mountains there where you see Oak Ridge, 76 degrees, 18% RH. You look at Santa Rosa Raz, it's 46 degrees, 30 degrees cooler, and 99% low humidity. So basically fog. Same county, same time of day, all a function of elevation. So here's actually at the Oak Ridge Station uh, last year, October, where we got a 0% relative humidity. And this is something I'm seeing with some of the burns we're doing with the Jenner Headlands. We're not getting 0%, but things are burning really well. And if you notice the uh, March 1st fire this year from uh, in Monorail, it's reported on March 1st. This is March 9th. Uh, firefighters got, were patrolling it, checking it, but they weren't staying around, staying up on the fire 24 hours a day and stayed warm, stayed dry. It was an ember, something happened. Uh, it didn't jump over the dozer line, but the fire got active at two o'clock in the morning because of this, it, this warm and dry uh, boundary of air um, up, above the cool marine air. You can actually see fog down there above um, over Monterey. So this is a real phenomenon uh, that sometimes catches firefighters by surprise and uh, happens at night. And then, you know, the offshore wind event, this is what it looks like um, when there's smoke in it. Uh, come over Mount uh, St. Helena. So the offshore wind events, that's what we always got to be looking out for. And I think that's our biggest wild card is how many offshore wind events are we going to get or how much wind are we going to get. So last two slides, these are the same slides I told the firefighters on May 10th. I haven't changed my prediction, um, but I've always talked about lightning coming of a Western Mount Tam, uh, the third and beyond of the high pressure subsidence, so our heat waves. Uh, you know, more and more dryness, dragon chains, those little things, average, ordinary task start fires. And then that day when the heat wave lets up, and now kind of like today, but yesterday it really wasn't a big heat wave, that relaxed day, uh, people get a little complacent. I watched the BI. The BI gets above 250. Okay, that means something to me. We've dodged many bullets, but BI above 250 seems to be a telling indicator. And then that drought drying out those large fields, which right now we're in really good position. They're above average. If they do start drying out, to me, the part of the county that's most effective is our forest. And I think there's people from the coastal forest on today. Uh, that's where we're going to get that forest, that timber fire that's going to be a lot of heat to come from the So my last slide, uh, spring rains, now early summer rains, have slowed our onset of, I'm going to say the summer fire season. Uh, the cool ocean means more fog. And I think we saw that last year in 2021. I'm trying to look more into this. I know it's out there. The cool ocean temps help create that um, cooler air, create the fog that then comes on shore. You guys have heard me talk about the greatest threat is our wind event. You know, there's alignment with fuel and topography. I think the public's going to continue to do a really good job of reducing our emissions. Right now, we know that mowing is like the seasonal the trend right now. People are trying to do the right thing wrong time of day. Um, there's public education about there, out there about that. Uh, one bad afternoon theory, those fires are going to happen. Even though I'm thinking we're going to have more of a slower fire season, we are going to have the one bad afternoon fires. 
And I think no matter what, we're going to have bad fires in California. Just hopefully they don't make the destructive list. And as far as homes burn, and no, life, no, continue to have no lives lost. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing screen. I'm uh, sorry, I went a little bit over. And I know this is all recorded now, so this could be used against me later. And I'll, st I'll stand up. I'll, I'll be held accountable. So thank you. Yes, that's that awesome, you. Marshall. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for the letter. I got it yesterday. And I okay. know I'm looking really bald. I'm not like that. <laughs> You're looking great. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Sorry, Dee, go ahead. No, no I was just going to uh, mimic your comment of it being great. Marshall's always fantastic. And we appreciate the time you take uh, for coming here so that we can get educated and then we can educate others. And uh, we do record them and they do get, uh, you know, looked at. And I think we should try to spin out the, the, um, the video that you gave us so that we can put that on our uh, website. Um, so I hope to see you soon, Marshall, under these same conditions, just talking about wildfires and not having any. You know? <laughs> Does anybody else have a, anything to say? Or maybe it's time to adjourn. I think it's time to adjourn. Thank you all. Take care, be safe, and have fun. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you next month. I can leave the room open for a minute in case anyone does have a question for Marshall. I'm just looking at the chat real quick, too. I think deep with something I wrapped the slide down as a fire in September 22. Um, yeah, probably did the wrong thing. <laughs> awesome. All right, see you later. All right, thanks. See you later. Thanks, Marshall. Awesome job. Yep, grazing works. I didn't, I didn't see Stephanie on here though. I know. I I love your point there. That was that was great. And I love all the 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 examples that you put at the end. It really helps us, you know, get that snapshot. Um, afterwards and get your interpretation too just really appreciate it i'm so glad it's recorded and i guess we'll get to see the video too so that's awesome thank you adriana for all you do to put these meetings together oh thanks susan all right take care all right bye everyone bye bye